Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics and I'm answering questions. So um, the question comes from Paul Ipwaka, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, P-O-L-E-E-P-W-K-A, and he asks, in a setup with multiple subwoofers and a processor equipped with direct live bass control, is it better to let Dirac handle the alignment and EQ of the subwoofers from the start, or should I manually align and roughly EQ them first before running Dirac? I'm already using a DSP for my DIY subs to apply a low shelf boost and also a low pass filter. Currently, I have four subwoofers, but plan to add more. My processor has five subwoofer outputs. From what I've understood in Anthony Grimani's videos, most professional calibrators align subwoofers manually and also EQ using only one output from the processor. What approach would provide the most optimal base performance? So we need to separate out what professionals do from what we're talking about here. And we also need to get a few things straight on how to handle this. Uh, but I do have a good answer for how we should be doing this. Okay, so let's start with should you be aligning and EQing manually first before letting Dirac do it? The answer is, under most circumstances, no. Now, you should be applying some EQ like he did, the shell filters, to boost the bass, because Dirac really shouldn't be extending the bandwidth of the system. Um, the low pass filter could be a good idea, but I would be I would say you want to apply that at like two or three hundred hertz or higher. You don't want to be applying and actually, I probably would apply it more like four or five hundred hertz, um, and then let Dirac do its own thing after that. I wouldn't do any alignment manually, and I wouldn't do any rough EQing manually because you're not going to be able to do what it's doing. To really understand this, if if you're already familiar with multi sub optimizer. Direct Live with Bass Control is more similar to that. And so there's alignment that needs to take place, but it's not necessarily doing a gross EQ across all the subs to just flatten the response. There is EQ being applied to the individual subs as well as across the subs to minimize the modal issues across the different seats. If you do the rough EQ, it's really wasteful. All you're really doing is providing it with information that it's gonna to need to get rid of anyway. So I wouldn't bother. It's not necessarily going to improve things, and it may actually make things harder or worse because you may put Dirac in a position where it needs to apply more EQ than it actually can. Now, after it's all done, you're more than wel welcome to look at the measurements in your key seats, specifically your RSP, your uh, reference seating position, and apply some EQ to, f to further correct it. Dirac often does a very good job, especially direct live with bass control, but it doesn't always get things perfectly right, and there are some weird anomalies we sometimes see. And so I look at it as the reverse of what you said, where you said, like, you rough it in, and then you let Dirac do it. It's more like I let Dirac rough it in, and then I fine-tune it. So Dirac will sometimes do things like there'll be a bit of a boost at 25 hertz for some reason, or there'll be a dip at 18 hertz, or there'll be an extra peak at 35 or 40 hertz, a couple of dB or something that shouldn't really be there. Why it's there, who knows? The algorithm apparently detected something and corrected for it and overcorrected or misunderstood that that key position was more critical. So it could be that if you averaged all the seating positions you took, you would actually find that that peak that you're seeing at 35 hertz is a good thing because it fills in a dip at other, free, at other positions, and so on average, it's a better measurement. But you may find that the effect it has on the key seat you're sitting in is not as good. Kind of related to that, I'll also mention. So, you should certainly try what's best for you, and there's no reason why you can't do one that looks at all the seats. But as default, I wouldn't assume that if you have a room like mine, for instance, where you've got six seats and two rows, three, three and two rows, so six seats total, that you should be doing the EQ across all the seats. If in fact, like in my room, those rear seats are very close to the wall and don't really have a very good response typically with these types of setups, you're probably better off focusing on the front row. Further, even if you didn't have a system like this, you may be overcompensating for the other seats in a way that isn't ideal for the performance in your RSP. And so you may be better off actually optimizing Dirac around one seat or two seats and not three or six. It's something to experiment with. I had mentioned to somebody else, a friend of mine, that I think probably in general, most people would prefer optimizing around one seat. And Dirac had apparently responded that they didn't agree with that. They think people should try both because they may find the other to be better. 
and they're not wrong, so I don't want to overstate this. But the reason I said what I said, and why I still think that's probably true, was that there had been a study done by Sean Olive and team at uh, Harmon where they were comparing different correction systems. Now, the specifics of what they found, I think, are not all that important. There was one finding, though, that I think is, and that was that their new correction system actually underperformed other correction systems, including their old one, when it was done based on all the seats. But when they redid it, focusing primarily on the RSP, the performance then went up. And so the recommendation became probably if you want the best possible sound, you should focus on that one RSP and not the rest. Now, I want to be clear, focus on the one RSP does not mean one measurement. And it does not mean that we were wrong when we said you should do eight measurements or 16 measurements or whatever, and you really only need one. What it means is that you're not going to spread the spatial measurements out over a really large area. You're going to focus those spatial measurements on a single seating position. Now, keep in mind that this is true for direct live with bass control. This is true for direct live. This would be true for Odyssey. It could be true for Anthem. This is not going to be true for Derek Art, and it's not going to be true for Trinov. Uh, so the optimizer, it would probably be true for, but the uh, waveforming, it would not. Waveforming and Art will improve the bass at every seat. And so there's no reason to focus on just one seat because that's not what it was designed for in the first place. But that's not what this individual is doing, and that's not what he asked for. So based on what he's asking me, what I would recommend is uh, let Direct Live do its own thing. The things you should do before you let Direct Live with bass control do its thing is apply that low pass filter. But again, it needs to be well above where the bass management is going to be taking place. So don't use it for bass management. And the other thing you should use it for is for uh, giving the intrinsic response of the subwoofer what it needs to be. So basically apply that EQ, typically shell filters work best. You could also use it if it has limiters, you can use it for protecting the subwoofers. Um, do all that ahead of time before Direct Live does its thing. You do, now this is part of the Direct Live setup, but you do want to make sure you get the levels right. So I would spend some time doing that before you even get into Direct Live, getting them all balanced as well as possible and at the right level, so that when you go through the Direct Live with Bass Control uh, Wizard, that when it gets to level setting, you have an easy time with it. But other than that, I would not spend any time EQing the response of them or phase align or sorry, time aligning, same thing really, but time aligning them. Instead, let Direct do that. It's gonna do a better job than you can probably do on your own anyway, and um, you can fine tune after the fact if need be. Um, obviously, when it's all said and done, I should add this, you should take confirmatory measurements. So one thing to keep in mind is, let's just say for the sake of argument that you, and I've seen people do this, and I, I'm not sure if they understand the error in their way on this one. They will take measurements around, let's say this one, like a couch, so like around the whole couch. They do the standard eight plus measurements here and here and here and all around. And then they confirm it at the end with like one or two measurements right here. And they say, it didn't look, look how lousy it is. It didn't work. And the problem is they didn't bother to actually confirm what Direct did. They confirmed a single point in space, which if your setup and your room combined don't yield very good minimization of spatial variance, yes, then that one measurement is probably going to look a lot worse than the average of all of them. That doesn't mean direct live with base control didn't work or it screwed up. It means that your room is a problem. Um, now, it could have screwed up. I don't want to say it's impossible. I'm just saying it doesn't mean that. So what you do want to do in that scenario is repeat the same positions and then take an average of those, an amplitude average of those, or an RMS average of those. And that will give you the information you really need to know to figure out how different you know, how good a job it did. The other piece of it, which you can do from all those measurements, is then look at the amount of variance between them. If there is significant variance between them, like I said, that's probably your room, not Direct Live, but it may mean that Direct Live's algorithm is struggling to find a solution that minimizes the variance. One answer you could try is to repeat the process over again. Because of the way the algorithm works and the fact that it starts by being fed a, uh, a random number, 
there's sometimes, and also just, I would just add, um, moving the microphones a little bit, sometimes changing the positions you use, maybe even a lot, you may have chosen some bad positions. Remember too, that the microphone should not be near the wall. So if you've got your couch shoved right up against the wall and then you put the microphone like an inch from the wall, that's gonna give you crappy results. So I would definitely move them all forward. If you really literally have the couch up against the wall, like you can do this and touch the wall, you probably need, first off, understand your system's compromised, period. Like there's nothing we can do about that one. You've chosen to stick it up against a wall. Two though, um, I would probably move all your measurements forward at least a foot. So even though they're not gonna be right where your head are, your head is, it's gonna improve the results overall because you just can't have microphones up against a wall. The microphones behave differently up against a wall than out in the room, and they behave differently than your ears would in that same scenario. So anyway, I hope that was helpful um, in figuring out how to do this, what to do to get the best results. Um, Thanks for watching my videos. I really appreciate it. We're going to try to keep getting more videos out. I'd like to do a lot more content. I've got all sorts of ideas. I'm just busy as can be. Um, I need, I need employees. <laughs> I need like a personal assistant. I need a project manager. Um, I, I think my personal assistant needs to be able to do like uh, social media and uh, uh, communications with my clients and uh, chase me around. I think that's probably the biggest one actually. She's largely been my wife's job, but she's got her own business and probably needs her own PA. But we'll see. Um, I decided to dress up for you guys, so I'm not doing this because I'm trying to be fancy. I just Somebody told me that because that's the look I tend to have when I'm out at conferences and such that I should repeat it in the videos. And I thought, why not? I like to dress up, and I don't. The videos you see me like wearing like a T-shirt or something, like that is actually how I dress like most of the time. But I like to dress up, and I do it so little that it's always a fun excuse. So... Literally got up, put on some dress clothes. I'm going to change out of this later for the rest of the day. I won't wear this all day. But hopefully you found this video interesting and helpful. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to get my uh, subscription level up because I think it's going to help get more consistent views. But my viewers, uh, my views have been pretty good other than the fact that we were doing like great up to August and then killed it with everything with the storms and all that. So I got to get everything back going again. But thank you for all of you who have stuck around. Hopefully everybody that left will come back and we'll have lots of new content. Um, I actually am hoping to get, I'll just mention this, I'm hoping to get some interesting new content on some products that you guys wouldn't typically get to see on YouTube videos in the way that I can get access to them. The problem I've got is that because these are very high-end products, the companies want to coordinate very carefully the messaging around the products and the way they're presented. So if I go to like Cedia, for instance, I can show you a large video wall from a high-end company that costs a half a million dollars and they don't really care because that's kind of the nature of that event. But if I go to their headquarters or their showroom or they send me one and I get to set it up in my house and play with it, they're, that they don't feel the same way about it. And so I got to check out in New York City, uh, I'm pretty sure I can mention this part of it, the Ventana video wall which is made by Megapixel. It is uh, the best video wall on the market. Um, and I can get into reasons why it is. That I'm not just saying that because I think it is. Like it legitimately is a technically superior product to the others on the market. Measures significantly better than anything else we've measured in every way we've looked at. However, um, they would not allow me to take videos and pictures of it for YouTube without first clearing it with their communications folks. And I didn't think about it ahead of time when I went there, so I didn't bother to ask and should have. So I am hoping to go out to their headquarters in January, uh, which is in LA, and uh, check it out. I'm hoping to bring a friend along with me who many of you actually know. And then we'll check the video out, or uh, check the video wall out, I should say. Hopefully shoot a little bit of video and let you guys see it. I understand it's really expensive. I actually would call that a value for what it is, even though it's crazy expensive. And I think I should do a whole video on what value means to me versus I think what some of you think of as value. To me, value isn't cheap. It's that it offers more performance for a given amount of money than other products do. So it offers more performance given that there are a, a significant number of products from other companies like Samsung, LG, Sony, Christie, et cetera, that are more expensive, but it offers better performance than those products do. Um, so I, I think it's a value for what it is, but it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. It is the most expensive TV you could buy kind of a thing. 
Um, but the performance is amazing. Like you could use this as a grading display if you wanted to, given its performance capabilities. It actually has the same peak nits, the same contrast ratio. Well, it's got a better contrast ratio, same peak nits, and the same color quality, color volume and, and coverage as the Sony grading displays do. The older one, I should say. I forget the exact model, but the 300, I believe it is. Maybe it's the 310. 310, I think it is, which could do 1,000 nits. This one can do 1,000 nits. This one does more than 100% of BT2020 in red and blue, and then it's like 94, 95% in green. The average then becomes about 94, 95%, but that's actually on par with what the grading displays are. And it's what you want. You, like being short on green is, is not a bad thing, um, especially when you've got full coverage of red and blue. And then contrast, they call it a billion to one because that's the dynamic range of the eye, but basically it's infinite. And while you may say, well, aren't all DV LEDs infinite? They're not actually. Most of them are 5,000 to one, 7,000 to one. What happens is they go down to a certain level of gray and then they turn off. And there's a big gap between the lowest level of gray and off. In the case of this one, there's no gap. It's just completely linear all the way down. So perfect PQ, PQ tracking. The EOTF would look perfect all the way up to its peak nits, which is, like I said, about 1,000 nits. And it doesn't dim when the whole display turns white like uh, an OLED would. So you can light up a tiny little piece at 1,000 nits or the whole screen if you want to. So it's really amazing uh, for what it is, just expensive. But there are people who can afford it, and it's a great option for them. So I'm hoping to coverage that, cover that, cover some more projectors that are really high-end. Again, not cheap, but they offer a lot of performance, and get more of that out in the channel. So thanks for watching. Uh, like I said, please subscribe, and I got more stuff coming.